Good morning, Church for the City. Let's give a warm welcome to our online campus, those that are watching from the prisons. We love you. God laid a verse on my heart last night I really want to share with you guys. It's from the book of John, chapter 11, verse 35. It's two words. Jesus wept. Now, right before this, Jesus is having a conversation with Mary, one of his followers. She had just lost her brother, Lazarus. Lazarus. She's brokenhearted. She's hurting. She falls at Jesus' feet, and she says, Jesus, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. As Jesus is walking to Lazarus' grave, it says that Jesus wept. And so what God wanted me to tell you this morning is that he sees you, he loves you, as you weep, so does he. And I don't know if you just left the grave of someone you love or you just left the grave of the person that you once were, but God's going to do amazing things in your life today, and he loves you, and now is the time. Let's pray together. God, I know that you have big things planned. I pray that as we listen to the message today, that there's fertile soil in our hearts, that this message just falls right into the places of our spirit that it needs to, and that we experience change in a way that never allows us to be the same ever again. God, do the things that only you can do. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together. Come on, church. Let's put our hands together this morning. Come on, sing this out. I'm praising the valley, I'm praise on the mountain, I praise when I'm sure, I praise when I'm doubting, I praise when I'm numbered, I praise when surrounded, cause praise is the waters, the enemy drowns in.
Come on, let's continue celebrating as we watch someone go public with their faith today. My name is Andrea. From a young age, I knew about God through growing up in a Christian household, but I never knew how to pursue a relationship with Christ. This led me to looking for love and validation in others. Because of that, I have struggled with low self-esteem, anxiety, and depression. I had no compass directing me in life. I was lost and ready for change. I downloaded the Bible app and started learning how to pray and talk to God. I learned that He is walking with me. When I would try to attend church in the past, I would always feel out of place and inadequate. Then I started coming to CTC. At this church, it's been different, and I feel like I belong. Since growing in my relationship with the Lord, He has shown me that for so long I tried hiding my face from Him and struggled to invite Him into all areas of my life. But even when I tried shutting Him out, He never stopped pursuing me. All I needed to do was look to Jesus, and now that I have, I can feel and see how He's changing me. Today I'm going public with my faith. Andrea, Jesus said every disciple should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And because of your confession of faith, today I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And according to scripture, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Come on, church, let's celebrate that today. Come on, let's just believe the Lord for breakthrough this morning. God is doing a new thing today. Whatever you touch 
kind of dismiss Judas and he said to them that I have desired to do this with you and he engaged in what we call the Lord's Supper it was right after they did the their last supper went into their last supper and the reason it was such a desire for him is because he he knew he had to establish the fact that he was Lord and that he had come as the Messiah for a particular purpose and that was to give his life and for his blood to be shed his communion at that time was so intimate because he wanted them to know this is why I'm here and this is why I believe you're following me and so every time that we engage here at the table of the Lord or the communion it's it's the same desire of Jesus his desire is to do this with you. But his desire also is that you understand why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I'm giving my life for you. In our case, Jesus already has. And so when we participate uh, in the communion and at the table of the Lord, we're responding to that moment. We're not there with the disciples, but he's present here with us. It's that this moment where you hear the Lord say, I have done this for you. And every time you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. I don't think any of us here will ever forget that Jesus died on the cross. But what we do risk forgetting is why he did it. He did it to save your soul for all eternity that you would be a Christ follower all the days of your life. Father, I thank you for this opportunity we have to receive again at the table of the Lord and be reminded that this Savior who looked into the eyes of those disciples is also looking up on us, saying to us, do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Let's drink together. 
Hallelujah. Let's look our eyes to Jesus. Oh, so Lord, you weary in trouble. No light in the darkness you see. And there's light for a look at the Savior in light. thankful for his grace this morning. Amen. So good to be in the presence of God. Who's happy to be at church this morning? Come on, it's the best place to be, the family of God, at the presence of our Savior. Well, we're going to turn to a minute to mingle this morning, church. Get to know the people around you as we prepare for the message this morning.
to you. Welcome to Church for the City, where we teach the Word of God, we encounter the presence of the Lord, and spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so uh, grateful that you've joined with us. I think we've done it already, but let's give a shout out to the online campus and to the prison uh, campus. We're so grateful for all of those that are tuning in uh, with us. Well, it's Labor Day uh, tomorrow, and so many of you, I believe, have um, a time off. And um, So I hope it's a day of rest, a day of family, enjoyment. It's also dove season, traveling. So we got a lot going on. People will either be resting or killing or, you know, <laughs> flying or killing. I don't know, however you, you want to view it. But whatever you do, just uh, enjoy your time, enjoy your family, and uh, so uh, grateful that we have opportunities for these days. Now, um, as you can probably notice on your sheet, we are trying to look through and plan toward what we need to do uh, in October uh, for a additional service. We have we've went through the summer pretty tight. Um, second service is even tighter than first on most occasions. Of course, today's a holiday, so it don't it, it's not the same on holidays, of course, in Yuma when it's hot. People get out of here when they can. But, um, but we've done all we can on parking, done all we can in children's ministry. We still got winter visitors coming in. But, you know, I got to tell you, even more so than winter visitors coming is we have a culture of inviting people. We love to invite people. We got good reason to invite people. If I wasn't the pastor here, I would still invite people because I think it's a great church. And so we don't want to lose that culture of inviting people. We never want people to think, I want to invite these folks, but don't know if I'm going to get a seat, don't know if they're going to be able to sit with me. And so it takes time to plan all of this out. And so that's why we're asking you to help us on this. So you got in front of you, and we're going to take a minute to do this right now, if you don't mind. You got in front of you, or maybe you're sitting on it. If you, if you don't have a paper in front of you, that means you sat on it. Uh, but we don't necessarily, Tammy, good to see you. We don't necessarily need to, we don't necessarily need your name. We're going to be doing this for three weeks. So if you do it this week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to inform those that wasn't here this week to do it next week and so on. But we'd like to get you to, to uh, help us out on this. It's, it's a simple thing. We do need to know how many kids you got and what service you'll come to. If the times was 8.30, I believe it's what, 10? 10 and 11.30. So if you take a minute to do that, they're going to come down. And when you do it, pass it down to which end should they pass it to? An end closer to the inside aisle or outside aisle? Or it doesn't matter. Inside, outside. Just pass it down to an end. And uh, they're going to collect those right now. And again, we're going to do this two more weeks. So if you do it this week, you won't necessarily need to do it the next two weeks. Uh, those three weeks will give us enough indication uh, to make sure as we look through this, plan through this, talk through this, that uh, we're more than prepared. It's going to mean some adjustment in the sanctuary with seating, also uh, some adjustment on the time, the, uh, the length of the, of the service. So all of that is being planned out, but your participation on, on that. Now, uh, commitment to on that doesn't mean, well, I said I was going to come to 8.30 and I'm not going to make it on time at 8.30, so I can't go at all. No. You, you understand what it means. Where would you lean if you would say my service will be 8.30, uh, 10, or 11.30? You're always welcome to come to any service, but uh, it gives us an idea of what we think we can uh, expect at certain certain times. So thank you so much for participating in that. Now today also is our City Life Group, which is our CLG fair, our small group fair. That will be happening in the lobby. There will be representatives from various small groups, men's groups, women's groups, uh, couples groups, young adult groups. Um, I think those, I think Rooted is already full. One class that I really highly uh, suggest, if you, if you don't have a small group, you it's an, it, it really is important that you, that you get in a small group uh, for community's sake, for learning's sake, for growing sake, uh, understanding more about uh, God and his word. But one that I'd like to recommend is Financial Peace University. If you haven't taken Financial Peace University, I encourage it. 
uh, Pastor Andy, and I'm not sure if there's anybody with him on that, but he does a great job of walking you through what God's Word says about our money and how our money is given to us as a gift of God that we can freely use for His purposes, His kingdom, and have more than enough to take care of your family. So I'm going to encourage you, if you need a small group and not sure what to plug into and never done financial peace, I'm going to encourage you to uh, sign up for financial peace. All right, this Thursday night is uh, Awakening Prayer. We look forward to that time together to worship uh, the Lord. And I do want to thank you for your generosity. Again, uh, as we have shifted from, from push pay to overflow, there have been so many of you that have uh, become first-time givers, and I'm so grateful. Again, many of you, yeah, I think that's worth celebrating. You've made a commitment. Many of you have received a card from me already. I told you already, you probably couldn't read it, but you, you saw I said thank you in his grip. That means that's, that's from me. I love you, and I want to say thank you. There'll be more of you, of course, that will get cards this week, but it's, it's, it's a huge thing. I, it, the Bible teaches us about giving, uh, that nothing belongs to us. It all belongs to the Lord. It all belongs to the Lord. And God actually, it's a gift of God that we have the ability to work and earn income. And, and every gift sends a message, right? Every gift. Anytime you open a gift, someone is sending a message to you. If you open up a gift and it's a nose hair razor, they're, they're sending a message, right? It, 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 every gift has a, a message. God gives, God's gift to us to help us financially is his way of saying to us, I will provide for you if you trust me. I will provide for you. And so every gift from God is worthy of celebration and the right response. So thank you for your giving. Thank you for your generosity. God is faithful to us. All right, we're going to pray. And I'm going to dive into the uh, message today. Let's go uh, before the Lord. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity indeed to be in your house with your people and to celebrate this opportunity that we have to glorify you and to worship you. It's because of your goodness and grace that we're here. None of us take this for granted. Father, my prayer is that even as the message is being spoken, we've honored you in our time of communion. We've honored you, Lord, in the worship. Lord, it's a beautiful thing to sing. Look upon the face of Jesus. Look into the eyes of Jesus and to see your love. How precious, Lord God, that is to us. And now, Lord, we pray that the spoken word will also minister to us. I pray that our hearts are open, minds are open to hear what the, what the scriptures are teaching. And that we'll embrace it and apply it to our life. Father, I also want to pray for those that, that this is a dove season. There'll be many out in various places, some from other parts of of the country. Lord, I do pray for safety for those that are out there. Lord, may they enjoy their time as a, as a group, but Lord, for, for safety indeed, there'll be many that will be traveling also through this weekend. I pray, Lord God, again, for covering and protection. Pray, Lord, for Pastor Sonny and, and Brittany Torres there at the church Phoenix as they, Lord, look to move into a new build, and I pray you provide for them. Lord, that they can continue to grow and to glorify you in their part of the vineyard there in the metro Phoenix area. Father, I pray for Pastor Daniel Ramos there in San Luis. And Lord, the church that he leads as they also build to have a greater impact, Lord, among those that they're ministering to. Lord, we pray for every church in this community, every church in this county. We want every church to grow. We want more people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's wonderful when we get to see celebrations like we did today with Andrea, Lord, people who come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ commit to walking with him through water baptism. Lord, we love to see that throughout our county, that Yuma County will be known as a place where Christ is glorified. And so, Lord, help us to be a church that's so much part of that, in all that we do. Father, we do love you, and we we thank you for your goodness and your grace. In Christ's name we pray. May the people of God say amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to go to Romans 12. 
Um, and last week we went verses 3 through 8. Today, I'm actually going to read 9 through 21, which takes us to the end of the chapter. But I'm actually only going to focus on, I think, through uh, verse number 15. This message has went through two major revisions. One was splitting it, uh, as I'm going to do, through, as you'll note with the reading. Uh, but then just some more revisions this morning on how I think I want to approach it uh, throughout. But for context's sake, um, I want to read the whole section, and then I'll let you know where I'm going. Romans chapter 12, verse number 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Verse number 14, I'm actually going to deal with next week, but for the sake of reading, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Verse 15, I'll deal with today. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, and the rest of this will be next week. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable and in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome, sorry, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So far, the reading of the word, you may be seated. Now, uh, as as you know, we've turned a corner from the heavy doctrinal and theological stuff and turned into, turned a corner into chapter 12, um, which, which deals mostly with gospel application. This is actually one of these sections in Scripture where I almost, part of my biggest struggle in studying this was, what do I need to tell them? Because the, the reading of the Scriptures is so plain. It's just, it's so clear. It's just telling us to love people. It's telling us to be hospitable. It's not like there's a whole lot of things in here that are hard to Uh, to understand. What Paul is doing now, honestly, is is taking us uh, from, for us to walk into gospel imperatives because he's given us the indicatives. We we are now to do based on what God has done. So there's a few imperatives here, just kind of basic instructions. Now, now that God has done what he has done, which is obviously the salvation that we experience, it kind of fuels us to do what the Christian life does. And again, what makes this, you would think this would be an easy message to give, but what makes it so hard is because it just makes so much sense. It's just, there's just so much common sense in here. It's like, Nobody needs a preacher to stand up here and tell them to be kind and to love people and don't take revenge on folks. You know, just leave that to God. Just be real in who you are and serve the Lord and, you know, work hard for the things of God. And when you're in trouble, uh, to pray. So I, I thought, well, I don't really need to do much with this. But then I realized, you pay me to do this. <laughs> so I need, to, I need to do my job, right? <laughs> I need to do my job. And so the bottom line of this really is just mere Christianity. That's really just the bottom line, mere Christianity. Jesus 
Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew 22, 37 and 39, I don't, I don't know if all the verses I'm going to use are going to be on the screen because I've changed it around some, but it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He just brings this down to loving him. And loving him, of course, as, as he said in the book of John, or John, the gospel of John wrote, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Jesus has done what he has done. That's the indicatives. Now it's for us the imperatives. What do we do now in response to that? He says, well, you just, you just love the Lord your God. Just love him. And also in loving the Lord your God, you, you love others as you love yourself. There's a whole lot more to unpack in there because you, you can't truly love other people if you don't love, your, love yourself. Uh, and, and I think Siri just said that. So uh, in, in as, you, as you love yourself, you also learn that you can love other people properly. And so the single most defining characteristic, though, that kind of highlights this is love. And that's why I just think a simple title for this is Mere Christianity. So nothing fancy today. I don't even think I'm going to raise my voice uh, at all. I think I'm just going to just talk and, and, and teach, and, and, uh, and then we sing a hymn, and that's it. So let's, let's, just, let's just deal with this. What does, what does love look like? And he starts out by saying it's without hypocrisy, that our love is... It should never be pretentious. We should never pretend that if we are believers that we should truly love people. The English word here, uh, sincere, it, it comes from two Latin words, which I may not say them properly, but sina sera is how it's written, and it just means without wax. And the idea was in, in that culture when people were selling pottery, if there was a piece of pottery that was a pot that was cracked, they would fill it up with wax where the crack was and then cover over it, glaze over it. And, and so what they were giving wasn't the true pot un, unmarked. It was cracked, but they covered it up so it didn't look like it was cracked. And so Paul is saying, don't let our love look like something that it's really not. Don't. Let, let our love be without wax, not any that we're, we're just filling it in to look like we truly do love people. Let it be without hypocrisy. Another uh, uh, wording of this or another construction of the words uh, is, and you've seen it, and I don't know what they call these particular uh, uh, venues now or acting events where they put on the mask. And uh, the mask could either show that they're sad or the mask could show that they're crying or the mask could show uh, that they're happy. And, and the truth of it is, you know, whatever's behind that mask, it doesn't mean that that's what the person is really feeling. The mask may show that they're crying, but they may not be literally crying at all. The mask could show that they're happy and behind the mask they could be angry. Or the mask could show that they're angry, but behind the mask they, they're, they're, they're smiling. They're actors. They're, they're revealing something they want you to see, but that's not who they really are. That's not what they're truly all about. So Paul is saying, don't let our love be with a phony mask. Don't, don't, don't be role-playing in this. Now, you, you, know, you know as well as I do, people can be difficult. I had one amen. I know y'all scared because you might be sitting next to somebody difficult. I get it. But, but how many of you know people can be difficult? We, we, we all got some flaws. We don't point to people in the church. Sorry, we don't do that. But we all, we all, we all, we all got some flaws. Uh, we, we all can be annoying in some kind of way. Uh, we all can react to things in a way that causes more tension and heartache. Sometimes some of our flaws can hurt folks. That's, that's just life. That's just people. And sometimes it's easier for us to judge people when they do those things and never really see that we do the same thing. We, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't see ourselves doing the same things, but we, uh, but, we, but we do. 
But, but here is where, again, where Paul's instructions is so real because he's letting us know love is not simply a feeling or emotion. I don't like when people say love is not a feeling. There is some feeling in love. There is some emotion. It's kind of not fair to say, you know, love is not uh, a feeling. Don't, don't cheat me out of what love feels like when you love me. Y'all hear me on that? Don't cheat me out of that. But we also know that the, the, uh, ver- the, the, the verb of love is an act of will. And we choose to love people. Even when we don't feel it, even when we're not feeling it, we choose to do so. And the only thing that really keeps us from loving people is honestly our unrepentant heart. That's the only thing, really, that keeps us from doing it. Because love for us as believers should be as natural as breathing. Because our Father is love, and he has put his spirit in us. So just as natural as it is for God the Father to love, it should be as natural for us to love. It should be as natural as breathing. And so when we're not loving as we should, that's because there's some stuff in our heart that's conflicting with what's natural. Anytime you have a problem naturally breathing, something in your lungs or bronchial system is conflicting with that. Anytime that we're not loving natural, something in our heart is conflicting with the love that is now naturally deposited in us from God from up on high. Can you say amen to that? And so, so we got we to gotta stop, re, stop pretending and start repenting. Just stop, re, stop pretending and start repenting. When you can't love someone like you should, don't make excuses on why you can't love them. Just say, Lord, just help me to get my heart right. Help me to get my heart right. Do they got problems? Of course they do. We all... God issues. One of my favorite commercials, and I know it's an old one, but the, I just love the fella. Uh, Rick is his name, I think, in the, uh, in the, uh, the commercials, the insurance commercials, uh, where he's trying to teach the folks to not be like their parents. I love the commercial, but I hate him because I see me in all those commercials. It's like... Well, what's wrong with teaching your kids that, right? But, but my favorite one is when they saw the person walk by in the blue hair, and he said, listen, we all see it. We all see it. We all see people's flaws. But let's not make that the focus of attention. Let's have our hearts right. I'm going to tell you, this is, this is what I know. I, I, I learned this in my own personal life. Jesus cannot love the fake you. He cannot love the fake you. He died on the cross for the real you. And you're messed up, jacked up self. When I came to the place to realize I do not have to pretend to be somebody that I'm not for Jesus to love me, I found out the love of Jesus in all of my flaws and all of my nonsense. So let our love be real. Uh, Also, he's saying here, let our love be grounded in the truth. He's saying detest, and he uses the word, depends on what translation we read, hate those things that are evil and cling to what is good. Love has to be grounded in truth. That's actually how love is defined. When, when, when when, When someone extends what they believe is love and it's not done in truth, it's not really love at all. When you, when you truly care about someone, that your sense of right and wrong gets thrown off because you're afraid to tell them what's wrong, you're not loving them. You're, act, you're actually, you're withholding from them. You're actually rejecting them. When you do not love people in truth, and so when you see, when you see things that they're doing wrong, but you think, well, that makes them happy so you don't really say anything, you're, you're not helping the problem. And we do that so often, we think, well, it's not the best thing for them, but it makes them happy. I don't, 
you can't care if it makes them happy because eventually it's going to hurt them. You know it's going to hurt them. And love steps into that and says, because I love you, I need to tell you what's right. I need to tell you that that is wrong. If you want to know a pet peeve of Tyrone P. Jones, it's watching parents who need to discipline their children and won't do it. Because they don't want to deal with them crying. They don't want to deal with them getting angry. They don't want to go through the nonsense. So they just do things to make them happy. One of the greatest temptations in my life is not stepping in, ripping off my belt, and whooping their behinds in front of mom and daddy. I mean, I just can't hardly stand it. It's like you're not loving that child. You're not loving them because you're afraid to discipline, because you're afraid to lose relationship. Parents aren't designed to be buddies, to be parents, to love them. There will be a time. Tyrone Jr. and I are much closer now than when he was a child. I can tell you that. <laughs> I can tell you that. There will be a time when parents are in a relationship that is so comfortable, so great, nobody misidentifies who's the father, who's the son, and verse, uh, vice versa, but yet we just love to hang out. But when you're raising them, that's not the time to be their buddy. That's the time to teach them. That's the time to be a parent. That's the time to discipline them and not give them everything they want because you don't want to see them crying. I tell you right now, the attorneys ain't going to stop from doing it. The judge ain't going to stop from doing it. They're going to lock their behinds up because you wouldn't do something about it when they were younger. And that's, that's still my quiet voice. And, and, and so, so love is in truth. Doing what's right, proclaiming what's right, instructed in what's, in what's right. We, we love each other enough to tell them the truth. Otherwise, it's not love at all, and we detest that. This word detest, it's, the word actually means to be horrified. It means to be horrified. We recognize when evil is corrupting someone, and we're horrified at what we see it doing to someone. Psalm 97.10 says, hate evil, you who love the Lord. Hate evil. Here's, here's a place where you got permission to hate something that's horrific, that's horrible. You hate evil, those who love the Lord. The opposite of that, of course, is clinging to what is good. We learned that. Philip taught us that also in verse number 2 of chapter 12. The good is God's good. What is acceptable? What is the perfect will of God? That's that's what we clean, that's what we grab a hold of. And so we tell the truth to people. When we love them, we tell them the truth. If you don't, then you're just falling into to your own selfish desire to be loved, afraid of losing that affection. Love is not enabling. Love is not crippling. Love in truth helps people through situations for their good. Y'all all right? All right, next, uh, love should feel like family. Verse number 10, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Two words here uh, in the Greek, philostorge. It, it's brought together as one construction, but it's actually two separate words that Paul just used as one. Of course, the word philio means uh, the love between friends, the love between brother, brothers and sisters, the word we get for brotherly love for Philadelphia. Storge means affection. So Paul is saying we love one another like family with a deep affection, a deep affection, and it should reflect family. Now, it's, it's really unfortunate that because, because the nuclear family, you know, it's been so broken up down through the years and through the culture, and, and we all know we got some jacked up situations in our family that sometimes when you say love one another like family, you immediately think of your family and think, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. But Let's just pretend for a moment that we all have healthy families. <laughs> Let's just pretend. And the truth of it is you, you understand, and it really should be no pretension uh, about it, because even, even with difficulties in family life, it should never change your love for your family. should never change it. 
should be love for your brother, love for your sisters, love uh, for your parents. There may be things you need to do based on how they have been and how you need to respond. But I've seen it time and time again at the end of the day, even with struggles and families. I've seen people rally around one another, even when they cannot hang out with one another, but love says this is family and we need to do what we need to do. That is so much the same with the church, so much the same with the church. It actually is the family of God. I think one of the great things about God and his sovereignty is that he knew what he established in the natural family from the beginning wouldn't remain the way that he desired it to be. It, we, we can see that from jump with, with Adam and Eve. We see it right, away, right off the bat with Cain and Abel. Never was God's intention for brother to rise up against brother. That's why the blood of Abel still cries out from the ground today because an act between two brothers that should have never happened has marked all of us and distorted all of us and has redefined how we look at family counter to what God's purposes was. I could go on down the line with Rebecca uh, Trick and Isaac, with Jacob and Esau. He knew that family would not stay the way that he uh, had set it out to do. But that's why we have one of the great benefits of the family of God. And at the end of the day, honestly, when we stand before the Lord at the end of time, when I stand before the Lord, I may not necessarily be surrounded by people in my natural family, but I will be surrounded by people in my spiritual family, people that have come into the family of faith. And this love with family, even those in the body of Christ, it's, it's without reciprocity. We don't do things in the family lovingly expecting anything in return. I've heard people say, man, I just keep loving them and keep loving them and keep loving them and I never get anything back. I'm done with that. Well, love is, is not looking for reciprocity. The value of love is not in what comes back to you. The value of love is loving deeply because Christ loved us deeply. I, 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 dread, I dread if God ever sat on the throne and says, I've loved Tyrone, I've loved Tyrone, I've loved Tyrone, I've loved Tyrone, and this is how he's responding back to me, I'm done with him. Can you imagine that? And, and, and there's nobody in here, nobody in here, you're talking about being honest. There ain't nobody in here that can say, well, God will never get to that point with me. you you just lying. All of us have done wrong toward God. Even on our best day, we don't get it right. On our best day. And thank God that he just keeps loving us without reciprocity. And then, and D, love recognizes the inherent worth God has placed in every person. The inherent worth. Every person has value. He says the honor. I think uh, the translation ESV and CSB says outdo one another in showing honor. There's, there's the noun honor and then there's the verb. The noun is, to, is when you have honor, you do what is right no matter what the cost is. No matter what the cost is. You, you're, you're being honest because, and you take the right action because that's honor. And, and there's, then there's honor in this particular case, the verb in the Greek construction is to show honor regarding respect for someone having a, a value of someone, acknowledging that that person is a person whose life was given because of the, of the almighty God. And, and you honor that person. The gospel teaches us to think differently about people. Even when people do some treacherous things, even when people do some, some horrible things, we, we lift them up before God in an honorable sense. I, I, I read a book of a, uh, of a man who got into a, uh, a tussle. He was attacked by some folks, got into a, to a fight, had a gun on him. Uh, and when the person he was fighting realized that he was going after the gun, uh, that the, sorry, the person he was fighting tried to get the gun from him, the person held on to his gun as you're, as you're taught to do and not let the gun go in the middle of the tussle. Uh, the, gun, the, the gun went off, the bullet shot the person who attacked him. 
In the book, though, what, what startled me and astonished me, which was probably the part that got me the most emotional, is that the police officer or the detective that was doing the investigation of the one who accidentally shot the person, he wrote what he observed before he walked in to see him. You know how they got that glass, you can hear what people are saying, see what people are doing. He said he stood there and he was astonished that the person who accidentally done the, shoddy, the, sh- the shooting was actually in there praying for the person who got shot saying that he's a valuable person. I know he has a good heart. This was just a bad thing. Praying for the person that accidentally got shot. The police officer, the judge, the, the, the attorney, because this all the transcript, was astonished at that kind of deal. That's honoring people. In spite of their action, in spite of what they had done. The Bible teaches us to do that with every person. Every person that we walk around with, every person we do life with, there's somebody whose life Jesus' blood has been given for. It's one of the reasons that we work so hard here at CTC, the, uh, the Guest Connects team, is that when people hit that parking lot, we want them to know no matter what part of life you've come from, no matter what you've experienced, there's a value that we have to you. The whole culture of honor. Rodney Starks is a historian. He, t- he was writing about the early church, and he noted all of the distinctives of the early church, and he said the church was the only place where the poor, the immigrants, people of different rank and nationality were all treated with the honor that comes from being a child of God. With the church, I saw the slave and the master being treated with equal value. It was incredibly attractive because it pointed to a new humanity. They valued those no one else would value. That's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, honoring people, putting a value on folks, not overlooking people in in society. They've all been created by God, whether they're immigrants, whether they're orphans, whether they're people rehabilitating out of prison, or whether they're the unborn. Whenever you got prejudice and and, uh, and racism is because somebody doesn't look upon somebody with the same honor and dignity that God does. That's where racism comes in. That's where prejudice comes in. The reason, and, and, you know, the, the reason that, that we have such uh, a, a position and stance on abortion, besides the biblical uh, fact of it, but it's, it's, it's dishonoring a life that God has put in the womb. It's dishonoring a life. And so love honors people shows great value. Well, those are the things of love. i got two minutes already. I I cut this down and still, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. I may have to just pick it up next week. But but let me just tell you what Christianity looks like, which love is Christianity, right? Did I say that? Yeah, but anyway, we got to act upon it now, so here we go. Verse 11 through 13 and 15, it says, Don't lack diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And and so Paul lays out just three things. I'll try to hit these as as quickly as I can and probably pick up a little bit more on them next week. But, But he is saying, listen, if we're Christians, if we're Christians, of course we love, but also we serve the Lord passionately. We serve the Lord passionately. He's using this word, don't be lazy. And he's actually talking about our service to the Lord. Now, nobody should be lazy anyway. Okay, pet peeve number two. (laughs) Pet peeve number one is parents who don't discipline their children. Pet peeve number two for me is lazy people. People who just will not work. Just lazy. I mean, just, just lazy. It's a four-letter word that ought to be considered a four-letter word. Lazy shouldn't be in your vocabulary, just like every other four-letter word. You know the four-letter words you're thinking right now. Put lazy in that mix. It shouldn't even fit in your thinking. Jesus talked about people who he had given gifts to and opportunities to, to, and and he talked about them being lazy. Matthew 25 26, Jesus described the lazy person. We picked up on this a little bit last week that he entrusted with something, and instead of them doing something, they just put the thing 
put the thing in the ground. Team, you can come. Just put it in the ground. Because what, what happens is he put his own convenience above the master's purpose. Put their own convenience above the master's purpose. And, and maybe I'll try to, to land right here. Because every one of us that have come into the kingdom of God, you have to realize we do not belong to ourself. You gave that right up. You gave that right up when you surrendered your life to Jesus. When you said Jesus was your Lord and Savior, Andy, don't leave. I'm going to do the altar call. You know you need to be saved. But, uh, no, but, uh, <laughs> just messing with you. I need to fill up some time and shut up. All right. So, just, just, just know this, that when you gave your life to Jesus, you gave up your life. You said to the Lord, my life belongs to me. I mean, to him, no longer to me. It belongs to him. And so if that's the case, then he's telling us, if you belong to me, then serve me passionately. Live your life out loud for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in a new community. The Greeks, the Romans, they wanted to separate how they thought about life. They, they categorize their life. There's my work life. That's one category. There's my family life. There's another category. There's my marriage life. There's another category. It's my emotional life, my mental life. We don't do that as Christians. All of our life belongs to him. Finances, emotionally, mentally, my marriage, my home life, my church life, my work life, my business. We're not, we're not businessmen that say, hey, I'm a Christian, but this is how I do business. No, all of our life belongs to him. That's serving the Lord. Of course, it also means serving in the church and volunteering and serving the community. But, but absolutely, the bottom line starts with, I'm giving my life to the Lord. He now is my master. And I'm the one subject to him. This word here is fervent. J.C. Ryle said, zeal in religion is a burning desire to please God to do his will, and to advocate his glory in the world in every possible way. A burning desire to please him. I, I get it. Every one of us have agendas that we wake up with in the morning. I get it. We got things we need to get done. We got businesses to run. We got people to oversee. But I'm telling you, it starts with how can I please God first? And letting all of that other stuff fall in line with that. All believers are called to serve the Lord. I'll, I'll close with this particular verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain with the Lord. That's, that's the passion of the believer, working, toiling, knowing that nothing I do is in vain for the Lord. That's fulfilling, that's fulfilling that imperative. I want to serve the Lord passionately. I'm going to have to pick up next week. I'll start out with trials, and then we'll roll on down. Stand with me, if you would. Let me pray. And, and I, I guess probably the best thing for me to do here is to uh, just share with you all of this starts with love as we started with and I, I I've learned something in in this life that I, I would say I probably didn't know really um, in earlier years I used to I used to think that you really couldn't love unless you had a relationship with Jesus. But, but I've discovered there are people who don't have a relationship with Jesus who actually can love people. They actually can love them. Why can they love them? Because we all are created in the image of God. And love is in that. But I tell you what I've come to know. You can't love perfectly without the love of Jesus. All of our love will be tainted all of our love can have some hypocrisy. All of our love can have some holes in it. We can love, 
without Jesus, but we love the people we like. We love the people we get something from. But Jesus died on the cross and showed us what perfect love looks like. Because he loved us even when we were unlovable. And don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself to think that you were lovable. I'm sorry, you weren't. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't fool yourself. You, you weren't lovable because you were a sinner. You were born in sin, living in sin. Your whole life was defined of your selfishness. And folks, get this, selfish living, selfish living is sin. All of us did it until Christ came into our life and showed us the perfection of love. Love without hypocrisy. Love that doesn't devalue people. Love that does not withhold truth. And there's nothing more brilliant than God sending his son to carry our sins on the cross to show us this is what true love is. It's brilliant. And so my encouragement, of course, most of this message was the people who know Jesus and certainly want you to, to get that and live it out. But if you're in this house and you really do want to love, you heard me say to love people without hypocrisy. You got people on your mind, people on your heart that you just, you just can't find a way to love them. You can't find a way to value them. You think more of them in a negative sense than you do a positive sense. I get all of that. But when you allow the love of Jesus to be poured in your heart, That'll overrule and override any of those ill thoughts you have about others. And you'll be able to love them in the manner that Christ has called us to. I'm going to pray with you. The, altar, the uh, prayer team is here. We're going to close this time. We're going to once again sing that dear song, Look Into the Eyes of Jesus. If you're here today and you haven't made a commitment, this is a great day for you to look up, lift up your head, and look into the eyes of Jesus Christ, who's loved you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, I want to thank you for this great opportunity, Lord God, to, to minister your word, to share the truth of the gospel. Lord, there's so much we could say, so much more we desire to say. But Lord, we, I pray, Lord, that what has been said will speak and resonate into the hearts and the minds of people that have listened, those that have watched. Let us take something, Lord God, that we can add to our life. But above all, let us take the love that you have truly shown us and let that be the love that naturally works through us as we receive you, accept you, and know you as Lord and Savior. Father, you are an amazing God. We thank you for the brilliance of the cross. We trust that we live this mere Christianity out loud. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you need prayer for anything, if you're making a commitment to Jesus, you can come. These dear people will be here with you. They can pray for you with any, for any need that you have. Also, you can stop at the Connect table and connect and go further in your faith. God bless you. Have a great day.
What an amazing message by Pastor Tyrone on what Christianity looks like, what love looks like. Imagine if we looked at every single person and loved them the way that God loves them, if we saw them the way that Jesus sees them. What would that do to our hearts? How would that change the way we impact others? Well, like you said, if you're new here, um, if you need prayer, the altars are open. Uh, loving people here to pray with you. If you're new here, please stop by the connect table on the way out or fill out the digital, digital connect card online. And uh, you can learn about things like baptism, open house, um, some of the things like Financial Peace University. We have a lot of awesome stuff going on here. Um, outside of that, thank you so much for being here today. We love you. We're always praying for you, and I hope you have a wonderful Sunday.